I think we'll be okay here. So, um, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for today, for this time of worship, for this time of giving you praise. Even though it's Saturday, Lord, uh, every day is your day. Any day of the week we can worship you. Every day we can worship you. Every day we should worship you. Every day, if we can, we should hear the word of the Lord. We should read the Bible. Read it every day. There's no day we can't. That's not proper. Every day is proper. And Lord, even this message as I'll go through the, the from Genesis to New Testament. Lord, you are there. You are in every part of this world. There's never a time you weren't here in the world. You were always around. And even though people sometimes didn't know it, Lord, you are here through all the decades, centuries, and the thousands and thousands of years of mankind. So, Father, we just come to you now. We depend on you. We need you. Lord, I need you. Without the anointing, my message is just, just words. And words, Lord, are effective. Words do mean things. But Lord, when your words come from you, it means the most. It can change hearts, change lives. I pray right now blessings and, and touching of God upon each and every one now. And Lord, upon this message, upon me, and Lord, that everyone that hear it will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I say good evening and good morning to others. My uh, message today is a message that came because of what I see going on in this world, what's going on in America, and what's going on in the universe. And my message is called, Who is Jesus? I was thinking a lot of people don't know who Jesus is. And who is Jesus may be completely different from different people. It's interesting, most people will consider him, even Muslims, absolutely consider him a good man. He was a prophet. He was all these different things that we can say he is. That he, But if you actually look and read what he said and what he did, a lot of these people would have to stand back and and maybe not agree that he was what they are saying. But the truth is, Jesus Christ um, is all the way through the Bible. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at who Jesus is. And so let's go to um, Genesis, if you want to follow the first book in the Bible, and verse 26. And... Um, uh, I'll read some footnotes and stuff, but Jesus was in the in the Word of God in the Old Testament. Uh, my Jewish friends and people I know that know Jesus know this, but many of them do not realize that Jesus Christ was always there. He was always there. So in Genesis verse 1, and... Uh, Chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let's, Let us, you ask us, make man in our image, after our likeness, let him, let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, and so forth. And this was the the first part of this verse is the only part I really want to focus on. That is, God said, let us. So God is talking, and God says, let us. So, um, 
And that is really important. So there's a mic on. If somebody can turn it off, I can hear everything you're doing. Um, so it says, let us make man in our image. So thank you. The making us, let us, us, U.S., that is a, a wonderful thing. It showed that in the very first chapter, the very first beginning of making the earth, making the cattle, making the air, the water, the sea, the heavens, and man, there was a us. The us was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is who the us is. Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. And I got a little footnote there. It says, God said, let us. The expression contains a very triune God. That is, triune is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the true three. The use of the plural us suggests and, and it says outright that God has a certain polarity. Uh, it's a, and revelation of, of the triunity of God does not become clear, however, to the New Testament. So this is a, something that in the Old Testament, People got, they got, they got some understanding, but they did not know what that meant. The Trinity was not known in the Old Testament, at least not to most people. And to understand what was going on at this moment, uh, it, it was not easy at that time. It definitely was, uh, us was unknown what that meant, but we now know that God's Son was around at that time. The Holy Spirit was around. So let's go now <clears throat> just to uh, Isaiah. I'm going to go over to Isaiah. And Isaiah has um, something I want to read here in chapter 9. And um, this is going to be not too much here. In chapter 9, we're going to read uh, verse 2. So let's see verse 2. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. Okay, I'll stop right there for a second. Who is the great light? You know, we know God, God is creator of the heaven and earth. But who is the great light? And the New Testament clearly says Jesus is the light of the world. So here again, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus, there's no doubt about it. A great light that they dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. So this is Isaiah, and it's talking to, you know, uh, God's people, and, and it's talking, actually this chapter is about the birth of Jesus. And the, the, the exciting thing, though, is it's talking about Jesus being the light. So the question is, who is Jesus? Jesus is the light. He's the light in the Old Testament. You know, the only, the difference is, is that the Christ was this, what we're talking about here. The Jesus was not yet born. The Jesus was the physical, the man. But the Christ part of that man was here. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light, that they dwell in the land of the shadow of death, Upon them hath the light shine, 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 shine. That's one of the songs we used to sing. Let us, let us shine, 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 and shine for Jesus, or Jesus shining on us is the same thing. And we shine for Jesus, shine so the world can see the Christ. And it's so wonderful if you have a Jewish a friend or a person you meet, and they don't realize Christ is in the Old Testament. And sometimes when you share these kind of verses, they, it just, they can't believe it, that Jesus was always here waiting for them. So praise the Lord. He has, he has been, since the creation of the world, Jesus has been there. And, you know, there's mystery to that. What does that mean? Whether Jesus, you know, where's the very beginning? But, you know, it don't matter. Those things we'll understand in heaven. What this is trying to tell us is what's important. 
is that Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus is there in beginning. Jesus is there in 2,000 years ago. Isn't it true then? Jesus will be with us to the end of this world and in the beginning of the new world. You know, nothing's really going to end. What's going to happen is everything will become new. It's not so much the world's going to disappear and, and all that, but God's going to come with fire and cleanse the world, and it's going to be new. I, I think um, that's such a wonderful thing. God never, there's nothing God ever gets rid of. You know, even, even a person that dies, uh, they continue. Their life continues. There's, there's an eternity to every part of our society, of our life. There's an eternity. Even the world has different things, happens to different part, even an earthquake and stuff. It just, elements of the earth change into different elements. The fire, the earthquake, uh, it just changes. But it's still all here. It still stays. It doesn't leave. Now let's go to chapter 9 again, Isaiah verses 6 and uh, verses 5 and 6. I'm sorry, yes. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so let's look at this, 5 and 6. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments, garments roll in blood. But this shall be the burning in few of fire. So this is um, uh, this chapter is, is the birth of, of Jesus is talking about, and it's it's going through some things it's talking about here, uh, but let's go to verse six, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government government is there only government in the world? No, guess what? The government of the the government in this world is much more than just uh, people. Um, uh, it's much more than just a worldly government. God has his own government. The foundation of that government was laid upon the cross. The beginning of that government was placed upon the cross. And that government is all getting ready and preparing to go full force to be running and controlling and working and blessing this world. It takes a little time. <laughs> Remember, a thousand years to God is as a, is a, as a, it's as a moment, really. It's like a day. Um, it's, it's, it's nothing. And, brothers and sisters, let me say this. No matter where you are, no matter who's listening to this, because this will be where other many will listen to it. God is preparing us for a great, great government. So if you're disappointed with the government you have now, you're disappointed with maybe leaders you have now, and um, I think different countries are pretty happy. Filipinos have a good president, I believe. Uh, the United States is... It's very different, very wrong. But no matter what, my point is, who is Jesus? Jesus is in charge of the government. And when his government comes down and takes over in rulership of this earth, there will never be any government like it. I don't care if uh, President Trump was the greatest government ever. It still won't compare. Not even close. Your president in the Philippines, same thing. President, uh, leaders in Israel, same thing. They will do the best they can, hopefully. They will be honest and upright, hopefully. But that does not mean they can even come close to what God can do. Jesus Christ will come riding on a horse. And he will be the ruler of this earth forever and ever. We don't know what that means. What does that mean one trillion years from now? One billion years from now? And yet it will be. And it will be an incredible enjoyment, life. 
It will be an incredible journey. There will be no getting tired of it. There will be no, oh, I, I, you know, this is you know, it's boring. No, no. Who is Jesus? Jesus is not boring. Jesus will be enjoyable. Jesus will be fun. And we, we know in the eternity, there will be different ages of who we were at, at our time. The Bible says we will be known as we are known. So I'm known at this age. It could be that's how people will know me. People know me at this age. We don't understand that completely. But there's absolutely babies that were born or, or even the ones that were um, had abortion. Oh, my. You know, such a precious thing that maybe someone that they, they did the wrong thing and, you know, they repented, they got saved, they found Jesus, or maybe they were Christian, but they had abortion. Can you imagine the wonderful reunion? <clears throat> when they die, they go to heaven, or the, heaven comes down to us, but whatever, and that little baby that they aborted will say, I am your daughter, I'm your son. I'm just saying we don't want to glorify it to make people think, oh, that's okay to have abortion then. No, it's not. No, it's murder. But God takes that little innocent soul, and that soul is waiting for the parent, hopefully, that the parent will come to heaven. So, one thing, you know, who is Jesus? Guess what? You know anyone that ever has had abortion? Anyone that has done really bad things, they feel so bad, give them the comfort. Let them, let them have the message of this. Tell them, who is Jesus? <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful message? Who is Jesus? It will give them all the answers they need. And in their sin, they will recognize they are forgiven. And they will find who is Jesus, a man, a God, a kingdom maker, Jesus Christ. And uh, he will give you peace for any sin you have done when you call upon him. So let's look now at um, something here I want to read. Uh, of course, in verse 7 goes to, of, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. So God's kingdom is connected to David's kingdom, and David was king of Israel, and one of the greatest kings he was. Uh, the book of Psalms is written by him and so forth. But Jesus is taking that kingdom, and then Jesus will have the perfect kingdom. And um, he'll establish judgment with justice forever, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's a wonderful thing. So let me read a little footnotes here. This foretells the birth of Messiah, Jesus Christ. His birth would be a definite time, a place in history. And this Masonic son would be born in a unique and marvelous way. A wonderful the Messiah would himself to be a supernatural wonder. The Messiah would be the incarnation of perfect wisdom and have words of eternal life as a counselor, Prince of Peace and all that, remember? As a counselor, he would disclose the perfect plan of salvation. Mighty God and the Messiah of all fullness of the dignity will exist in bodily form. Everlasting Father, he is not only would come to reveal the Heavenly Father, this is the Old Testament, but this is what's going to happen. But he himself would act toward his people eternally as compassionate Father who loves, protects, and supplies the need of his children. Peace his Prince of Peace, his rule would bring peace with God and for mankind through deliverance from sin and death. And that's, that's such a wonderful thing. And so this is who Jesus is. He is in the Old Testament who he's going to be, but this is a picture. He's going to be a ruler in government. He's going to be king. 
And, uh, you know, when they were going to crucify him, they were saying, you know, who are you? You know, what? You know, they were trying to have him admit that he was God. But he came to be a humble lamb and to die on the cross. So he did not come to be king at that time, but to prepare the way for it and to give people the forgiveness for their sins. So in time, when he died and rose again, then we look to him as the king. But until then, he was a humble servant, serving us through Jesus Christ. So let's look here now. Let's go to um, Malachi. Malachi. Malachi, I love that word. And um, we're going to go look at uh, chapter 4 and verses 2 and 3. This is about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so 2 and 3, chapter 4, Malachi. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness. Now, my Bible says S-U-N. Yet I don't understand that. I think they made a mistake. It's S-O-N. The Son of Righteousness. Arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves in of the stall. And you shall tread upon the wicked, for they shall be ashes under your soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, this is the coming day of the Lord is talking about. Talking about what's going to happen. Uh, talking about the wicked will be tread upon, they will be destroyed. Uh, they should be ashes, ashes, like uh, fire ashes, under the soles of the feet of the Lord. And uh, the Lord will do this, it says. Um, so that we fear that name the Son of Righteousness. We need to fear Christ. Uh, he, he rises with healings in his wings. Well, what is healing? Healing speaks in another place about his wings. And under the shadow of his wings, you know, we have healing. Uh, there's a healing through Christ. A healing that gives us um, uh, you know, eternal life. Gives us healing maybe for our bodies. Healing for our souls be born again, be forgiven, all that healing. And so, there's a footnote here, it says, um, unto you that fear my name, that the day of the Lord also means salvation and deliverance for all who love and serve him. In his kingdom, God's glory and righteousness will shine like the sun, bringing to his faithful people the blessings of salvation and healing God's people will respond to his goodness and favor by leaping for joy like calves released from the stall. This is an incredible time because what is the greatest healing we can get? One thing and one thing only, and that is salvation. Salvation is the greatest healing any of us can have. We definitely have great healing in salvation. And that is what saves our souls and gives us eternal life. Okay. And let's go to also, Malachi also, uh, chapter 4 again, in verses 5 and 6. And it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So it's talking about it's going to make people's hearts grow together. You know, what happens is we get saved, we find the Lord. What happens? One of the first things is every one of us is we want to make things right with other people. We want to be right with our father. We want to be right with our children. 
That's what it's talking about. One of the great benefits for even worldly people is when a Christian, when a person becomes a Christian, they become born again. They are able to do something that they couldn't do before. And that is they're able to love people they were mad at or someone had hurt them. But yet they're able to say, listen, because Jesus is in my heart, I can now love you. And that's a great thing. It's a great thing. So let's go here and um, let's just read this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Elijah is John the Baptist. Before the coming, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers of the children and the heart of the children of the fathers, lest I come and smite the whole earth with a curse. So, in other words, he wants to save as many as he can. He doesn't want to smite everybody. He wants people to have a choice to know the Lord. So, I got a footnote for there and it says, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Elijah would come and minister before the coming day of the Lord. Uh, some also believe that Elijah, I believe he's going to be one of the two great prophets that will stand witnessing him. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> oh boy. Him and Moses will stand the last days in the, in the temple or in the Israel, I should say. Anyway, some also believe that Elijah will again come during the tribulation. That's what I mean. Uh, Peter and will be one of the two witnesses mentioned in Revelation. So, and turn the heart of fathers to children. Future ministry of the coming prophet is described in terms of putting families right with God and each other. John the Baptist preached this end. Uh, so that was what he preached. There can be no blessing from God or abundant life in the Spirit if God's people do not make family authority, love, and faithfulness absolute priorities in the church. The purity and righteousness of the home must be maintained and our congregations will fail. You know, it will fail. We will fail. Families start not in the church. It has to start at home. We have to have strong family at home. Strength in the family. Family grows from what we do at home. And when we have a strong family in home, and if the church has all families that are strong, guess what? The church is extremely strong. strong. That makes a strong church. So now we're going to go to the New Testament. We're going to go to the book of Mark. And we're doing okay here for time. Uh, Mark chapter 14. So we're going to go to chapter 14 here. Uh, for quite a few different verses, but let's go 13 and verses 34 and 36. So 34, let's go there first. And it says, And he said unto them, this is um, Jesus saying, um, This was in the garden at Gethsemane, and they were praying. This is when Judas came with the soldiers and they arrested Jesus. But this is uh, after the um, having the supper, the last supper, and they, they are there, and he said uh, and he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Uh, tarry ye here and watch. This is absolutely, I understand this completely. When, um, like before I preach, um, I often will get on my knees, maybe not just before, but I'll spend time on my knees because I really need to become humble before God. I need to become humble. I need to uh, really come to a place of really uh, focusing on Jesus. And this is it. And he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And so he was very, very sorrowful at that point. He knew he was going to die. He knew he would be put on the cross. But this was something that was over, overly more. Because see, as Christ, as Jesus, as Jesus Christ, he could at any moment call the angels and he would be taken out of that. He would not have to suffer. He knew that. 
None of us have that power. None of us can, at that moment, we're going to be put to death for something that is unfair. We don't have that power. Uh, most likely, unless we've got soldiers that can come in and try to rescue us. But that's what the angels were like. They were like soldiers. They came and rescued if he called. But his sorrow was he knew he needed to do this for people to find Jesus. So let's go to the other verses, 36. And it says, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. In other words, he says, You can do anything. You can rescue me out of this, anything. And um, take away this cup from me. So Jesus is saying, take away me being crucified. He said that. Yet he said also, nevertheless, not that I will, but what thou will. So here's the question again. Who is Jesus? Guess what? And we need to be like Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is humble. He's broken. He's sorrowful in, in sadness that he, of what is going to happen. So he's very much like human. But he's also saying, God, take this from me. We say that. Take this from me. And yet he said, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. That to me is the perfect prayer. Some people don't believe that, that's fine. But for me, I always say, God, your will be done. You know, verse 38 says, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. So, spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And we got to remember who Jesus is. He was broken. He was just like any other person at that point. He said, God, I, I'm like a water. This is so bad. This is so hard. Take this from me. But not my will, thy will be done. So, the will, thy will be done. And then we're going to go to the same chapter, 14. We're going to go to verses uh, 48 and 49. And it will be the boldness of Christ, even in the uh, fall, even in the face of death. This is the boldness of Christ. In other words, the message is, who is Jesus? This will be who is Jesus. Look at this. And remember, the message is about who Jesus is. And this is who we need to be. Not just who Jesus is, but who is Jesus so that we can be Jesus. And so it says here, 48 and 49, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief? with swords and with star staves to take me. So he's talking to the soldiers. They did not have guns, but they had swords. They had uh, staves. I think it's, it's like a wood, maybe uh, maybe something wood, and a sword is metal. A wood, I think, would be the staves that you like pound into the ground uh, to take me. I was daily with you, every day with you in the temple teaching, and you, and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. So in other words, he's saying, you know, I was there, you didn't take me, now they're taking me in secret. And see, whenever you, things are done in secret, that often means they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. So... Who is Jesus? Jesus is the one here that could have called the angels to come down. They couldn't have touched him. They could not have touched him. He could have them all just disappear. They all could have been burned up in fire, like in the Old Testament. But rather, Jesus allowed them to take him. This is who we need to be. We need to allow us to maybe misunderstood even, but if that represents standing for Christ, then so be it. People don't understand who Jesus is. And so we need to show that Jesus is able to trust his Father. We need to trust our Father. So, the boldness of Christ, even in the face of death. He was bold, bold. This did not, this did not scare him. 
He was absolutely bold in this. Now let's go to um, Mark 14 and verse 62. One verse, 62. And it says, Jesus said, I am. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, the question was, Art thou the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand. So this is when they're standing before the high priest. And they're questioning him. They're trying to get witnesses. And they couldn't get no witnesses to agree. They couldn't get no one to come. They had to have witnesses that agreed. They couldn't get that. Finally, they, they say, Jesus, the priest says to him directly, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus says, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So this is only to point out one thing, and I'll get into what's going on at that time so much, but Jesus was the Son of God, sitting on the right, sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. This means this is who he is. He is the authority of God on the right hand. And uh, that is a picture of who is Jesus for us. I am, and it says, And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand, and power coming in the clouds of heaven. It is talking about what will happen in the end days. Not now, not then, but it's coming. Ye shall see. It's talking to us. It's talking to whoever will be here then. And the whole human race will see it. Past and present. Absolutely. We shall see Christ coming back. Um, sitting on the right hand. And coming in the clouds of heaven. It's so powerful. Christ is a picture that we need to be like Christ. We also sit with Christ in heavenly places. It's a very good teaching I should do sometimes, sitting in heavenly places with Christ. That is what we do now. Let's go to um, Mark 15 and verse 5. Okay, I'll try to keep my time here. Verse 5. And Jesus, this is uh, before Pontius Pilate, and Jesus yet answered nothing, so Pilate marveled. Now, I just wanted to say that because to marvel for Pilate, one of the Roman leaders, it was incredible for him to marvel at something. He's seen everything. But he marveled. And what did he marvel at? He marveled because of what Jesus was doing. He, and we're going to go to the book of John now. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. But he marveled at what Jesus would be questioned, and he answered nothing. In other words... Jesus wasn't trying to defend himself. And I think Pilate was absolutely certain Jesus was no criminal. He was no bad person. And he, couldn't, he, he marveled, which is more than just he couldn't understand. He marveled that Jesus just stood there. And I think he really recognized Jesus was very special. He couldn't understand it. But he knew this was very special person and in verse um, let's, uh, 16 and 17 also let's go there it says uh, no let's go let's go to uh, John first John chapter 19 and I'll just read this verses 10 and 11 and it says and then saith Pilate unto him speakest thou unto me knows now not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee so this is what was not in Mark but this is what was really said. And he says, so he's saying, Jesus, don't you understand? I can crucify you. I can set you free. I have the power. And Jesus answered, listen to this. Thou could have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So, but he's telling Pilate, you have no power. You have no power. You could do nothing unless the the 
It would give thee from above, from God, unless God give you. What incredible revelation. What a credible thing. And I think that's about the place that he said he marveled. Just before Jesus said this, I think, but he marveled. He marveled. And so Jesus explained to him, you couldn't do anything unless God above gave you the ability to do that. And uh, that that's most... Uh, let me just read the first note. It says, power given thee from above. Jesus says that all earthly power exists only as God permits it. Pilate's sin was yielding to the crowd because of political, uh, you know, po for political reasons. And that is the reason Pilate was doing that. He was doing it to please the crowd. But that was not going to happen. And, and, uh, and uh, Pilate's sin was yielding to the crowd. Israel's sin was greater. They were rejecting the Messiah. So I think Pilate did what he was supposed to do, uh, but he didn't understand it. So let's go back. So remember, who is Jesus? And Jesus was there standing in the presence of this court, and yet he was innocent, and yet uh, he said you could do nothing unless God uh, would uh, allow you to. So let's go back to 15 of Mark, chapter 15, verses uh, 16 and 17, and it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and planted a crown of thorns and put on upon his head. Now, I want to read that for this reason. Uh, this message is about who is Jesus. In some ways, it's about who is Jesus as we know Jesus. It's also about who is Jesus in us, Jesus, and who is Jesus in the heavenly realm, Jesus. So it's many different forms of Jesus. And I just want to point out the thorns, though. This crown of thorns, I was in Israel, and they said these would have been really sharp, they would have been very long, and they figured they would go into the skull. I think something like half an inch or something. It would go, it would penetrate. It would not just go through the skin, because Jesus would die anyway. This was what they would do. They put this on, and it penetrate into the skull, into the brain, and there's your question I have for you. Who is Jesus in you? Can you wear the thorns? Can you have that pain? Can you have, well, of course, we're not going to go through suffering like that, probably. But that is who Jesus was. He is willing to suffer and to die for us. Can we do that to one another? Can we serve God to one another? Okay, let's get to the finish here. And um, uh, let's go to um, First Peter. And I am sorry, I I, uh, I think we've got to end here pretty soon. But let's go First Peter. And I just want to look at this. First Peter is really something. <sighs> First Peter, chapter one, and verses three and five, three through five. Chapter 1, 3 through 5. And it says, Blessed be the God. This is Peter. Um, Peter the Apostle Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A lively hope. That means a hope that is for sure to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. So our inheritance is incorruptible, it's undefiled, you can't defile it, and that fadeth not away, it reserve in heaven for you. We have a hope in heaven for us, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So that is the hope we have that is what's kept for us in heaven. Um, it's talking about the uh, audience. It's, it's talking about what God has reserved for us, our salvation, our walk with Him. It has kept us and reserved us 
to have eternal life. So let's go to 16 and 17. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy as all manner of conversation. See, again, the message, who is Jesus? Let's learn. Let's look at this. It says, but as he is, hath been called, you is holy. He has called you. Jesus is holy. So be ye holy as all manner of conversation, what we say and what we think. Because as written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Mm, isn't that wonderful? Be ye holy, for I am holy. Um, so, that is what the Lord wants. And so, hmm. and um, be ye holy as I am holy. You know, if you could just do that one thing, that will give you a relationship with Christ. Because walking holy means you really abstain from doing sinful things. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, we got to wrap up here. Um, trying to figure out what I can do yet. Let's do 19. 19 through 25. And it says, um, well, it talks about the blood of Christ. Let's. I think I need to finish here. Um, I'm going to read a footnote for the being holy. God is holy, and what is true of God must be true of his people. Holiness carries the thoughts of being separate from ungodly ways of the world, and set apart for love, for service, and for worship of God. Holiness is the goal and purpose of our election in Christ. It means being like God and being dedicated to Him, living to please Him. We are made holy by the sanctifying word, work of the Holy Spirit and the Word, by the power of the cross in delivering us from sin, by being renewed in the image of Christ, and by inf infusion of grace to obey God according to His Word. Mm. So praise the Lord. God wants us to be holy even as He is holy. And um, that is really great. So, you know, you know, as humans, as people, um, I think I'm going to have to stop there. I do have something in uh, uh, Second Peter, uh, verse uh, 1 through 10. You can look at that if you want. And then... Um, uh, and also Peter 4, 1 and 2. And I, I'll just read that. I want to read that and then we'll finish. This is Christ's suffering and, re and Redeemer for our sins. Let's read that. Uh, chapter uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. Brother and sister, let's go. Uh, 4 and 1 and 2. So It says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, but he, but be, but he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Ain't that wonderful? And footnote to that it says, he that hath suffered, those who willingly suffer for the cause of Christ find it easier to resist sin and to follow Christ, God's word, God's will. They have united themselves with Christ and share his cross. As a result, the pole of sin is made it's, it's gone. The pole of sin is insignificant and the will of God paramount. In other words, the pole of sin is almost gone and the will of God is so paramount, it's so important. Hallelujah. This spiritual principle will work in the lives of all believers, obeying God even when it means suffering. Ridicule or rejection will strengthen us morally and spiritually, and we will receive from God a greater 
grace. I, I got to stop because we are way over here, or at least over enough. I think I may speak on this again. I think I may uh, actually make a part two here. But it's incredible. I know what it's talking about. It's talking about the grace of God. It's talking about living for God. It's talking about what's going on in this world right now. I absolutely will say, and I believe, United States will have great persecution come before Jesus will return. Some Christians don't want to believe that. They think we'll just go, but that's fine. Maybe I'm wrong. But I, I do believe we have to ha go through a purification. People that live in communist countries and persecuted countries like China, they know what I'm talking about. They will, they will be sad for us because we do not know what it's like to suffer for Christ. Suffering for Christ is a reward and it's a great blessing. It, I will have to preach on this. It will be a part two. Uh, let's just say I can see where God's leading me with this. Who is Jesus? Jesus is not just the happy, the joy, the gl glorious thing. But Jesus is also the suffering, the pain, persecution. And all that comes to what? comes through eternally we will stand before God rejoicing that we were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. So let's finish in prayer and thank you for everyone and I pray this will be a message that will touch people not only now but in the future. In Jesus name I just want to pray. Father thank you. You are so good. You are so wonderful. Lord you care for us so much. You love us Lord, thank you that you show us who Jesus is. You show us who your Son is. That, Lord, we need to be the Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, the King. Not just the man Christ. That the Bible says he was just ordinary. You wouldn't even notice him in the crowd. But, Lord, the Jesus, the Christ. The one that is the man God. Lord, all women, all men, all children, all ages need to have the man God. If I'm speaking to anyone that doesn't know Jesus, and yes, that's possible, oh my goodness, you can contact me or you can simply say to Jesus, Lord, I know you are God. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I repent.